Hi and welcome to a new and probably also very exciting topic because today's topic is going to be about AMD EPIC overclocking. So you probably remember my video series from like four, five, six months ago where I was comparing AMD Threadriver to AMD EPIC CPUs and my conclusion basically back in the days was that AMD is going to launch a 32-core 30, uh, 32 AMD Threadriver CPU because everything else didn't make sense like dummy dice and all this kind of stuff didn't make sense and during computer techs which i'm sure you are all aware of amd announced the 32 core amd threadriver cpu so the 2990x should be uh, in the stores in about one month from now on if we believe the rumors especially the stuff on wccf tech seems to be quite reliable so i will put the link in the description um, a lot of the stuff we were doing today in the video is based on the information i found on there Personally, I didn't touch a 2990X yet. I don't have one. Um, so all my stuff in this video is based on the rumors based in this news. So in here I have an AMD EPIC 32 core, which is the 7,601, which costs around four and a half thousand euros. And it's a quite impressive CPU, I have to say that. And we managed to overclock this CPU. So basically, what we can do with this CPU is we can kind of simulate a 2990X, which I think will be live in like one month. The base for today's testing was the Super Micro Board SP3 Socket H11SSL-I, which is the cheapest and also most available SP3 socket board I could find for this EPIC CPU. I used it in combination with Crucial Memory Sticks, so huge thanks to Crucial for supporting me in this project. They actually sent 16 sticks of 8 GB RDIM to me, 2666. Um, dual ranked, so very good sticks, very good performance, so massive thanks to Crucial for supporting me on this. The system was powered by a Seasonic 850 Watt Prime Platinum PSU and the whole setup was cooled with a chiller. So basically I needed a chiller because I was running into OCP of the CPU, which means it's the overcurrent protection of the VRM. The VRM on the board on the Super Micro board is obviously not made for overclocking because obviously EPIC is not meant to be overclocked. I'm actually not sure if you can even overclock all EPIC CPUs or if it's just this sample. Anyway, so the VRM on the Super Micro board is international rectifier based. It's actually quite good. The components itself, it's only a six phase VRM though, because as I said before, it's not made for a very high power consumption. The first thing I did was removing the VRM cooler because actually it's very small so it wouldn't really do much and I had to remove it so I could solder a wire to the VRM to measure the uh, voltage of the CPU and also I attached a thermal couple to one of the MOSFETs so I could keep track on the MOSFET temperature. Luckily a Cinebench run on a 32 core CPU is really really quick especially once it's overclocked and full out on the memory so luckily it's very short. So the VRM temperature at 1.25 volt was typically around 60 to 70 degrees Celsius max. So that's the case of the MOSFET, which is perfectly fine, I think. I didn't really want to stress it for more than that. But um, so yeah, the VRM was kind of fine for this basic testing. So if we believe the rumors on WCCF tech, the 2990X will have a base clock of 3.4 gigahertz on all 32 cores. So the first thing I did was testing Cinebench R15 on 3.4 gigahertz on all cores on the EPIC 7601. So the initial test I did was with only four DIMMs because you have to consider the main difference between EPIC and Threadriver is that Threadriver only has quad channel and EPIC has octa channel. So that could theoretically make a huge difference and I wanted to see how big the difference is. So I first occupied only four DIMM slots, did basic testing. As I said, CPU was clocked to 3.4 gigahertz on all 32 cores. I ran Cinebench and the score was 3867 points, which seemed kind of low considering that the 16 core 1950X has a score of around 3000 points. So then I occupied all the DIMM slots and wow, the performance was really amazing. So 5,200 points in Cinebench at a base clock of 3.4 gigahertz. As I said before, memory was clocked 
at 2666 MHz. I couldn't even change memory divider or even um, memory clocks, uh, memory timings in the BIOS. So there was nothing I could do about that. But just moving from quad channel to octa channel changed the score by around 1400 points. So then I performed some ADA64 testing because I wanted to see what the memory bandwidth is like if we compare quad to octa channel. So the basic testing I did first was with a 1950X with memory kit of 3200 MHz, uh, obviously quad channel. So read 64 GB per second, write 74 GB per second, copy 66 GB per second. If I performed the same testing again, with the AMD EPIC 7601. This time the EPIC was clocked to 3.8 gigahertz. The read was 66 gigabyte per second, write 64 gigabyte per second and copy 61 gigabyte per second. So it's quite close to the AMD Threadripper. Obviously Threadripper was uh, occupied with higher performing memory modules. So that could explain the performance difference in the memory speed. Then I occupied all the DIMM slots again and ran the same testing again. So read was 124 GB per second, write 126 GB per second and copy 118 GB per second. And that's absolutely massive. And that also explains why there is such a huge performance difference in Cinebench R15. So the question is going to be, how will be the performance inference on Threadripper? I'm not sure if AMD did some kind of workarounds if there's something they can tweak, for example, in Infinity Fabric, um, so four DIMMs will be fine on Threadripper, I have absolutely no idea, but it could be that Threadripper performs um, quite a lot less compared to Threadripper because this is running octa-channel and Threadripper can only run quad-channel. So going back to Cinebench R15, I tried to overclock the CPU as high as possible. Still, I was limited by the OCP of the motherboard. So I could only overclock the CPU to 3.8 gigahertz and 1.25 volt. If I increased voltage or clocks, power consumption would be too high and it would trigger the OCP, so the overcurrent protection of the motherboard, which then results of the VRM dropping the voltage. You can actually see that if we measure the voltage during the run, Typically the load voltage was like 1.3 volt measuring from this point. It's quite an inaccurate point actually, but it's, it was just as a reference for me so I could see if I could apply the voltage or not. And you can see that the voltage drops from like 1.3 volt to zero volt, which then just shows that we triggered OCP. And performing the Cinebench run at 3.8 gigahertz across all the 32 cores at 1.25 volt is really massive. So it's 5,871 points. I ran it several times to see if there is some kind of huge point fluctuation, but it seems to be very accurate, very stable scores. So around 5,800, 5,900 at 3.8 gigahertz. So as I said before, um, it would be absolutely amazing if the Threadripper 32 core would perform the same. I kind of doubt it because of the memory limitation, which I'm not sure how high the memory limitation will be for Threadripper, but I think there will be some, some kind of memory limitation to it. Talking about limitations, I recently did an interview on uh, PC Gamer where I was talking about that I don't really think that it makes much sense for the gaming segment to have so many cores at the moment, specifically talking about the gaming segment. Obviously it makes sense if you have some kind of professional applications, if you can really utilize so many cores, it makes sense to get a 32 core CPU, but if you're a gamer, it really, it really doesn't make sense because no game is optimized for it. Obviously, we will see some kind of optimization in the future, but I'm pretty sure um, by that, uh, yeah, it will take probably like three or four more years until we will see some proper improvements in core utilization. So I performed some 3D Mark testings. So 3D Mark Firestrike, you can now see the task manager while running 3D Mark Firestrike physics test. It's a synthetic benchmark, so it's kind of optimized for multi-threading and even this test can only utilize 16 threads properly. Then I thought, okay, 3D Mark, 3D Mark Firestrike is quite old by now, so let's go to maybe 3D Mark Time Spy, see how this one runs. So 3D Mark Time Spy physics, and then I figured out that um, 3D Mark Time Spy physics can apparently only utilize around 32 threads, which is still, it's a lot. But considering that the 32 core has 64 threads, it will not be able to utilize all the power. So we will also not see massive performance increments in any kind of synthetic 3D mark in the future. So once there is the 32 core Threadripper launch, 
Obviously, when we will see the benchmarks, I'm pretty sure you will not see any kind of gains in any 3D application, no matter if it's any game or if it's a synthetic 3D benchmark. Then I also asked myself, even neglecting the OCP, how high can I push the CPU? So again, CPU was running with a chiller, so CPU temperature was around 15 degrees Celsius, water temperature was 11 degrees. I didn't want to go much colder just because of the condensation, but still with 1.3 volt roughly on the CPU, I could push the CPU in 50 megahertz steps up to 4.2 gigahertz where it eventually crashed. So I think with um, probably the same cooling, but better VRM, no OCP, higher voltage, we would probably be able to push the CPU to four gigahertz. So I'm also sure that we will be able to push the 32 core thread bar to also around this region on all cores. That's what I would assume. But yeah, talking about VRM and power consumption, I'm pretty sure this will be really interesting again. So power consumption of this chip, the first testing I done, um, I measured 22 amps across the 8-pin connector because typically all the boards I know, they all draw the CPU faces just from the 8-pin and, and they don't really draw power um, from the 24-pin. So I was kind of fooled by that first, but then I was pointed at also looking at the 24-pin power consumption. So there are two 12-volt wires coming from the 24-pin connector and then I used the current clamp also on those two connectors and I ran again Cinebench R15, 3.8 gigahertz, 1.25 volt and I had a peak power draw of 32.5 amps. So times 12 volts, that's 390 watts, so probably around 350 watt power consumption of the CPU at 3.8 gigahertz, 1.25 volts. So obviously if we would push the CPU higher, let's say 4 gigahertz, maybe 1.35 volt, I would assume that we will see a region of like 400 to 500 watt peak under load. And this is going to be really interesting again, because this kind of reminds me um, on Skylake X VRM. So I'm really curious how the main boards will be. Obviously I will test it again um, once the 32 core thread bar is out and then we will see how the main boards can actually cope with a 32 core overclocked thread bar CPU. I almost forgot, I also did some more Cinebench testing, so I also did Cinebench scaling testing. So I ran Cinebench in 100 megahertz steps, starting from 3 gigahertz, ending at 3.8 gigahertz. You can see starting at around 4,600 points, ending at around 5,900 points. So um, if we would just follow this line, we can kind of assume that the CPU at 4 gigahertz will for sure be above 6,000 points, so probably like 6,100 points, which is absolutely massive. Multi-threading wise, it's, it's amazing. I have to absolutely admit that. So the only question I'm asking myself is how high will the influence on the quad channel be on the Threadripper CPU? I also did single core testing, so single uh, threading test in Cinebench R15, which was not really impressive. So it was around 134 points in single threaded testing at 3.8 gigahertz. If we think about that, um, the 1950X has around 160 points yeah, it just shows again that this CPU is probably not the best for gaming because that's where you need single core performance and that where, for example, a 2700X would be the much better choice. So that's it for today about AMD Epic overclocking. I will have another video coming in around two to three weeks about AMD Epic overclocking. I'm actually waiting for some more, yeah, very specific hardware, let's say like that. So stay tuned for that. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, comments, thoughts about 2990X, leave it in the comments below. See you soon.